How you doing? I'm Joe Dallas. Thank you for joining me. This podcast, Christians in a Cancel Culture, is a place where we talk about how some voices in the culture are trying to, well, in essence, cancel truth, which can't be done, can it? <laughs> you simply can't cancel the truth, but you can attempt to silence expressions of the truth. Now, one way of doing that is coercion, pass a law, or intimidate through threats of violence. But another form, I believe, is revision. That is, in essence, go to the alleged experts and get them to revise their position on truth, and thereby you have canceled the truths that you find to be inconvenient. Now, I got to hand it to the gay rights movement. It has uh, mastered the art of revisionism. Um, In the early 70s, as the movement was uh, starting to accelerate, It started asking the questions, what saith the psychiatric experts? Let's get them to revise their position, which they did. Uh, They successfully got the American Psychiatric Association to revise the diagnostic status of homosexuality from uh, a diagnosable unnatural condition to um, something initially that was regarded as neutral. Then in the early 90s, the gay rights movement started saying, well, what saith the scientist about the origins of homosexuality? Well, science didn't say anything in particular about it at the time, so they started getting scientists to revise the position uh, on homosexuality by saying that it was something inborn. And so we began to see a whole trend towards studies claiming that they had proven uh, homosexuality is an inborn condition and thereby it should be normalized. Today, ironically, the movement is borrowing from Scripture itself by asking the question Paul asked the Romans, what saith the Scripture? I believe that's the last frontier. Get the culture to revise its position psychologically, sociologically, statistically, then finally go to the root of uh, what is... uh, the traditional position for so many people, and that is the scripture itself. Back in 1995, the gay columnist Paul Varnell wrote, and I quote, the chief opposition to gay equality is religious. We may conduct much of our liberation efforts in the political sphere or even the cultural sphere, but always undergirding those and slowing our progress is the religious moral sphere. If we could hasten the pace of change there, our overall progress would accelerate. In fact, it would be assured. Well, I agree, because a large part of the population um, is not all that interested in what psychiatry says about a moral issue. They're not all that interested in what might cause someone to be attracted to a particular type of behavior. That part of the population asks itself, we ask ourselves, what saith the scripture? Now, if you can revise that part of the population's understanding of the Bible itself, you're pretty much guaranteed a home run. Well, that is uh, what introduces the topic of pro-gay theology. That is the uh, interpretation of scripture, a revision of scripture, which in essence tells us that scriptural references to homosexuality are really not references to homosexuality at all and that the Bible is essentially silent on the subject. Therefore, we can take a gay affirmative position. The best advocate I know for the traditional view is our guest today, Dr. Robert Gagnon. Robert Gagnon is professor of New Testament theology at Houston Baptist University. Uh, Previously, he was a tenured associate professor of New Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, where he taught for 23 years. He holds a BA degree from Dartmouth College, an MTS from Harvard Divinity School, and a PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. Dr. Gagnon's main fields of interest are Pauline theology and sexual issues in the Bible. He's the author of The Bible and Homosexual Practice, Text and Hermeneutics, by the way, Uh, That that is still the gold standard on pro-gay theology. So uh, if you do not have a copy of that, you do need to get one. The Bible and Homosexual Practice Text and Hermeneutics. Dr. Gagnon also, as a service to the church, provides a large amount of free material on his website dealing with scripture and homosexuality. In addition, he has been quoted in or has written for the New York Times, National Public Radio, CNN, U.S. News and World Report, Christianity Today, Christian Century and other news outlets and popular magazines. Well, (laughs) Dr. Gagnon, Robert, it's great seeing you again. Thank you for taking the time to be here. I sure appreciate it. 
Thanks for having me on, Joe. I have great respect for you and for the ministry you conduct. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Well, let's uh, dive right in. There is more to talk about than we will probably have time for in these two episodes we're doing together. But uh, just so that we can get to know you a little better, can you help us understand what prompted your interest in this subject to begin with? Well, it wasn't anything I expected to be doing in life. This wasn't my 20-year plan when I started out (laughs) in the academy, I can tell you. When I arrived at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, the PCUSA Church was doing a church-wide study on the issue. Uh, In other words, it's continue to remain open on the question until you resolve it in their favor, and then they stop being open about discussion. Uh, So I uh, entered uh, Pittsburgh Seminary as a new faculty member, a New Testament, and people in the area, lots of Presbyterian churches in the Pittsburgh area, we're looking for somebody to present the uh, what they call the traditional view of the issue, and they could get hardly anybody. So for me, it's like the old Laurel and Hardy films where they attempt to join the Foreign Legion, and they tell the uh, gathered that this is going to be a very dangerous mission, and and uh, so we'd like you to take a step forward if you you'd like to undertake it voluntarily. Everybody else took a step back, and then the boys are left <laughs> front crying. So I, that's sort of what happened in my case. <sighs> And uh, so in a low-level way, I got involved in the issue in presentations at local churches in Pittsburgh. And I thought out of that, you know, I think I have something to say about this issue, so I'll write an article. And then I realized, you know what, there's, there's not going to be any um, academic periodical that's going to publish this from this perspective. So I'll try to do an edited book and get some other people to contribute uh, an article. And as they, I was waiting for their contribution, I kept working on mine and, you know, it grew, um, kept growing till finally it became a 500 page manuscript. And that's all that the, uh, publishers wanted. So, um, but it's like, that. it's like a Pandora's box. It's, it's one door opens another door. It really addresses every element of scripture at one level or another. It's not just this little small matter, but it touches everything in Scripture, the whole fabric of it. Hmm. You know, um, I have spoken on this podcast before about my own background, uh, Rob. And as you know, I was with a gay affirming church from 1978 until late 1983. And um, I was on staff with the Metropolitan Community Church, which at that time was about the only game in town. Point is, when Dr. John Boswell released his book, uh, uh, Christianity, Social Tolerance, and Homosexuality, we were delighted that there was virtually no challenge for so many years. Hmm. So that work went unnoticed, it seemed to us, by the conservative Bible-believing population. So that gave us entree to people who considered themselves middle of the road or were more liberal uh, in their beliefs, and it remained largely unchallenged. I got to say, your book would have been our worst nightmare in those (laughs) days. Uh, I still refer to it as, well, as I said earlier, as the gold standard. When that was published, The Bible and Homosexual Practice, by the way, what what year was that? That was in the 90s. 2000. Oh, 2000. Okay, yeah, Mm -hmm. when that was released. Um, of course, by then you you had established yourself as a teacher, speaker, writer, and so forth. Did you get much or any pushback from your academic peers at that time? Oh, it was uh, from the standpoint of advancement in the academy. It was the absolute dumbest thing that I could have done. And the reason um, why you had so few works, as you noted, uh, speaking to the so-called traditional view, which is really the scriptural view. Uh, is because everybody knows that to do that, you're going to pay an enormous academic price. And for me, this indicate how dumb a move it was on my point from that perspective. Uh, it was the my tenure presenting book. And uh, so that was incredibly foolish. The president there, he warned me, he said, don't do this. Uh, I got to say that's gonna, funny. <laughs> you're going to have lots of opponents when you do that. And in fact, a sort of a major letter writing campaign started the, wow. the several moderators, past and present, from the PCUSA wrote this president saying this guy has to be denied tenure. Um, they tried to get lots of people to write in to say that. Then the renewal groups got word of this. And they also did their letter writing campaign on my behalf. And uh, the president 
comes to me and he says, you know, tell people to stop writing. I I don't even know this is going on, you know, but it, it sort of became a major battle. Uh, and in the end, I did get tenure, but it was the hardest fought successful tenure decision in the history of the institution. And all these people, liberals, right, who are supposed to be tolerant mm-hmm. of others, other viewpoints, you come to find out it's exactly the opposite. They're only tolerant about the views that they hold. They're not tolerant about the views that they oppose. And I, just even process and everything else, it was unbelievable what I had to go through. Mm. Now, I'm going to make a guess that the people who were calling for you to be denied tenure, the people who were saying the book is terrible, you're terrible, whatever, did not directly engage you or the book with the issues in the book. Am I right or am I wrong? Very little. My book had had been largely ignored uh, by the Academy precisely because they can't address the arguments. Really, not till William Loder... Uh, an Australian biblical scholar who's written more on sexual ethics and early Judaism and early Christianity than anyone else in the modern era. He finally took on my book. And you know, the thing about that was we basically agreed on the main points. Now, Uh he's a pro-gay scholar, thoroughly Uh supportive of gay marriage. Uh But in the end, in terms of what Paul thought, in terms of what Jesus thought, in terms of the Old Testament witness, He agrees, more or less, a couple of disagreements, but more or less agrees that the scripture is unanimously opposed. And even Jesus, he acknowledges, would have been opposed to every form of homosexual practice imaginable, including consensual committed unions. But he just said, I can quote him actually from a, uh, we actually engaged each other at a National Society of Biblical Literature meeting. And uh, that was uh, reviewing his book, The New Testament and Sexuality. And uh, he, he basically acknowledged that I was the only scholar on the panel. The other, other persons were pro-gay writers who were just trying to impute their meaning into the text. Uh-huh. And he, but even though we disagreed about whether or not homosexual practice is morally good or not, he said, but well, basically, we really, really don't have much to debate about here in terms of reading the biblical text, uh, he says, I just disagree with Jesus. Extraordinary. You know, as as astonishing as that statement is, personally, I respect that more than somebody who says, well, I'm going to change the words of Jesus. I'm going to reinterpret the words of Jesus. I'm going to ascribe to Jesus meanings that he never intended. Um, at, at, At least there's the honesty of saying, yeah, he did say that. I just don't agree with him, which, I mean, uh, again, uh, uh, I find it more compelling. I think Christians are much more susceptible to someone who says, the Bible is authoritative. It is the inspired word of God. We have simply misunderstood it. That is more insidious, and that tends to get people's attention more than someone who just says, well, the Bible's not really authoritative. I don't believe it is the word of God. And I've had debates with, for example, um, I had a debate with the academic dean of Yale Divinity School, Mm -hmm. and we each had a half hour presentation. And at the end, he went first, I went second, and then we had a chance of 15 minutes of rebuttal for each. And uh, he started his rebuttal by saying, well, after, by the way, having tried to make a case from scripture for his viewpoint supporting homosexual unions, he said after my presentation, well, it's really not about scripture for me anyway. Mm-hmm. And he said one or two other remarks and sat down. And to which I responded to the moderator, can I have the rest of his time? Because you know, <laughs> I've got a lot more to present to you. Yeah. You know, yeah. and another occasion I debated with a uh, professor at Fuller Seminary who was supporting homosexual unions. I'm sorry, Dan- a professor at Fuller. At uh, Fuller, Daniel Kirk. And uh, And he started his presentation by saying that Dr. Gagnon is going to indicate that uh, no writer of scripture and even Jesus himself would not have accepted any form of homosexual union. And I agree with that, he said. I just think that Jesus had insufficient knowledge to make that determination. See, I'm just shutting up to let that sink in. 
I this is a fuller professor. And I thought at that point, Jesus I've had insufficient debate. knowledge. Yeah. I, I, yeah I mean, at some point, I, I at least again, as astonishing as that is, at some point, I, I at least think we need to recognize that the debate goes to the broader issue of who knows what. Does God know what he's doing? Did exactly. are, are we teaching God something new? about the human experience that he didn't already know. And is he scratching his head saying, oh, guys, thank you so much. If I'd have known that, I'd have never put those prohibitions in Leviticus. Gee, exactly. you know. Um, but again, I, I, I really think this is sort of like, you know, there was a movie that came out about 20 years ago called While You Were Sleeping. And I've often thought that's a great title for modern Christianity. While we were sleeping, a lot of the tears got sown and people, you know, don't realize that this kind of thinking has sprung up in some of our most allegedly conservative institutions. And so parents are still spending hundreds of thousands of dollars sending their kids to these institutions thinking they're getting a biblical training when, in mm -hmm. fact, they're getting an undermining um, of, of sound doctrine. And this is, again, an example that I, I think people needed to hear was that this was a fuller uh, uh Professor, I should say parenthetically on Fuller's behalf that uh, this issue for Kirk uh, led him to actually write another book about Jesus in which he indicated all the ways Jesus didn't know things. And mm. so basically he had to work to undermine uh, not only the authority of the church, but the authority of the Lord himself mm -hmm. in order to justify what he was doing. And in the end, because he did that, Fuller did not give him tenure. Thankfully, there that, wasn't that much I'm glad to hear. Faculty. That much I'm glad to hear. What other uh, professional or personal consequences? And let me backtrack a little, Rob, when I say that. Um, you don't take a stand on this issue. You don't take a biblical stand on this issue without paying some kind of a price. Now, I'm not saying that makes us martyrs. I don't believe that it does. But I, I think it just indicates what a foothold the revisionist position has gotten uh, in, on, on this issue and what a foothold error has gotten on it and how this really gets back to the whole idea of just sound doctrine not being tolerated any longer. As you were saying earlier, the diversity crowd tends to knock on the door and say, diversity, diversity, let us have a seat at the table. Then once we're in, uniformity, conformity, no room for any other viewpoints. And unfortunately, a lot of us fell for that. A lot of us fell for that. What uh, other professional or personal consequences could, could you help us understand that you've experienced for the position you take? Well, I can't uh, really speak much to the position of Pittsburgh Theological Reason uh, Seminary for various reasons, uh, my old job there. Uh, I can say to people that uh, um, we agreed to sever, and I, in agreeing to sever, uh, was left unemployed. Uh, even though I was tenured at the institution. I can tell people that I continue to be faithful in teaching orthodox sexual ethics uh, there, and I continue to teach on the atonement as Jesus Christ making amends for our sins faithfully, uh, but I am uh, I had to leave. Well, I left that position. We came to some agreement, and I can only leave it there, but I can tell you, you can a surmise based on what I've said about my tenure decision and the so. obstacles that were posed there, things that go on. I can tell you that in the academy, if you apply for a position in anything but an evangelical institution, and you have something in your record indicating that you've supported the biblical position on a male-female requirement for sexual ethic, lots of luck getting a job. Not mm -hmm. going to happen. Mm -hmm. And even in evangelical seminaries, they often don't want anything like that because they don't want attention drawn to them on this issue. They're trying to fly under the radar. Um, I could tell you stories about when I tried to find a position later, even among evangelical institutions. I was so incredibly naive. I thought that, you know, people will say, look, this guy risked his academic career to, to write what he wrote. And so that we didn't have to do that, we're so grateful, we'll be happy to give him a position. I didn't get that kind of welcome from most evangelical institutions. 
I got one job offer at Houston Baptist University. That was it. I could fill a drawer with rejections from evangelical seminaries and colleges. And in instances where I was able to get some inside information, the word that I had received was, this guy's too hot to handle. It's going to create a, a magnet. Uh, Pro-gay groups are going to focus on us. It's going to challenge our accreditation, uh, our, our tax um, situation. And so it's better just to leave it alone and not to hire somebody like that. Although we're grateful for what you did. Mm -hmm. Sure. Me, this is extraordinary yeah. uh, actions on the part of the evangelical communion. You know, um, you used the word naive in reference to yourself, but I think it is also naive for the church to think that by avoiding or shunning or, or rejecting uh, people like yourself who have been taking a clear position, that they will remain under the radar. Because I, I think it indicates an, an unawareness of the fact that, hey, the powers that be are going to ferret out anybody. I mean, you are going to be asked to take a position. To me, this is Sir Thomas More all over again. Will you or will you not approve of the marriage? And mm -hmm. you're going to have to sign a statement one way or another. So it, it is very naive to think that you're going to be able to claim neutrality on this or sort of minimize its importance and get away with that. Which leads to a, a last question for today. You have dealt with pastors, and I know personally many pastors who have referred people to your work and many pastors who've utilized your writings. Um, what do you think is the uh, status of pastors today and their ability to deal with this issue? Do you feel that our church leaders are equipped to address this? No, uh, generally I don't. And the reason why is we've let go the whole discussion of sexual ethics generally on the issue where we, it's very rare to go to a church where you'll act, even an evangelical church, where the pastor will have presentations on sexual purity and what that entails across the board. And part of that, I think, is because of a, a some sense positive, a natural modesty that people have about talking about such an intimate and personal question like that. But we don't have that luxury anymore. Got that right. Let that go. And what I'm really impressed by when I look at scripture, uh, you know, it's a different a different venue that Paul operated in from the one that Jesus operated in. He operated in a, a Palestinian uh, milieu in which he mostly interacted with other Jews who had a very clear position on sexual ethics on these matters. And what Jesus did was simply close remaining loopholes that existed in the law based on conformity to a male, fe male female requirement. Whereas Paul, of course, operating in the ancient Mediterranean basin, uh, could no longer presume that kind of general acceptance of sexual norms. In fact, with Gentiles, quite the opposite. So what we find Paul doing in all of his letters, with the exception of Philemon, which is only one chapter, we always have Paul indicating that uh, not only that sexual ethics is important, but I've already discussed this with you. Mm -hmm. And I've warned you before. And now I'm warning you again, uh -huh. for example, as he does in Galatians, as he does in 1 Corinthians, that if you continue in a sexually immoral conduct, whether that be incest, fornication, adultery, same-sex intercourse, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God that I've been proclaiming to you. You will mm -hmm. not get eternal life. And, um, and this Paul presents as the second most important thing that he presented to his uh, communities. First is, of course, to get straight, no idolatry, worship of God and God's son alone. But next on the list, and you see this in the vice or offender list as well, always first or second is going to be no idolatry, no sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, and so this is a constant for Paul's uh, discussions with his communities. And yet it's not a constant in today's churches. But we're now in the situation that Paul was in when he proclaimed the gospel in, in the, in the mid-first century across the Mediterranean basin. We can no longer assume a general acceptance of sexual norms, even by young people 
raised in evangelical households. I mean, I had one episode we, when I was at Pittsburgh Seminary, we had a youth ministry program uh, for the summer. We invited for two weeks students who were graduating from high school before they're going to college and maybe get them to think about theological ministry and the future of their academic work. And uh, I was allowed to do that once, just once to teach them. And, uh, and during one of my presentations, well, actually, when I started the week, I simply said, um, I'd like to take a little survey about what your view is on homosexual practice. I did, and about 90% of the students gathered there favored it, accepted it. Then I gave them teaching at the end of the two weeks on this issue. And then I gave them a survey, the last class, what, what was your view now? It had switched now to be to 80% favoring the biblical position. But they simply had absolutely zero training on it from their pastors, from their youth group ministers, nothing. So really what we're fighting in the church is a cone of silence around this issue that has to be broken. You know, I, I, I mean, it's a little exasperating because obviously we cannot expect the average pastor to, to be a Dr. Robert Gagnon, nor, nor do I see a need for that, you know. Um, but for heaven's sake, pastors, youth ministry leaders, disciples in the church can teach the scripture. I mean, this we can do. We don't have to have a PhD to do it. So it says a lot, I think, about the state of the church that, uh, that we see that kind of a, of a void which you are filling. Now, we've talked about a lot of bad news. Let's talk about some good news so that we end on a more positive note. Uh, you wrote to me about an upcoming project that you're developing that I was very excited about, and that includes a manuscript you're completing, which will be a complete analysis of each book of the Bible. Can you tell us a little about that book and then about the Zoom course that you're offering in connection with it? Yes, one of the one of the great things uh, teaching at Pittsburgh, uh, Houston, uh, the Houston Baptist University, in addition to having such great colleagues who are solidly Christ centered in their position, is that they they regularly require all undergraduates to take an introduction, one semester introduction to the Bible course. Awesome. So I've been teaching that regularly since I've been there, and it's caused me to do a lot of additional work on the Old Testament material. And, uh, and really to put together a manuscript that I wish that I had when I was a student at Dartmouth College so many decades ago. And so that's coming along very well. Um, I have a very complete PowerPoint presentation at this point for every book of the Bible. Uh, and I've been working on a manuscript related to that. And I feel I'll have that done by the end of the summer and send it off to publishers for uh, publication. And uh, then in conjunction with that, in the fall, I'll be doing a auditors or surveyors, a surveyor course using synchronous Zoom. And anyone from around the country uh, can join in. We'll be meeting once a week. That particular day is yet to be determined. But we'll meet once a week for two and a half hours. And we're going to cover the entire Bible. And using my manuscript and the PowerPoint presentation that I put together for this. So I'm very excited about that. If anyone is interested, they can uh, contact me at my HBU email address, which is easily obtained online, and I'd be happy to tell them more information about that. Now, this is critical. Are, are you then uh, taking registrations now, or if people contact you, they'll at least be put on a waiting list? Because I assume people hearing this are going to want to know. Yes, yeah, so the uh, actual registration will be a little bit later on in the toward the end of the spring term. But if they can, they can notify me now and I'll be sure to get back to them when that information is up. Okay. In the meantime, what sure I need to, to know from people too. is what day of the week is going to work best for them and pick the day that will satisfy most people. Okay. You know, a good word, I think, for you um, would be reliable, among other things. I, I know you've probably been called a lot of names. Uh, <laughs> I, I know I've had my share. But uh, I do thank you for being a reliable source uh, for people who are not only wanting to know what the truth is, but also how to articulate and then defend the truth. Because more than ever, we need people who will equip us uh, in that area as well. So thank you for the work that you've done. Thank you, thank you for taking the time to be with us. 
uh, uh, you're going to join us next week as well because there's more to talk about. So I'm so looking forward to that, Rob. But again, great to see you. Thank you for being here. Thanks so and, much. And uh, I want to thank you for being with us as well today. We are here uh, every Friday, Christians in a Cancel Culture. Hey, if you have not yet picked up a copy of my recent book, Christians in a Cancel Culture, which this podcast is based on, I wrote this to equip the average believer to be able to intelligently discuss abortion, critical race theory, homosexuality, transgender, and progressive Christianity. Uh, you can get your copy on Amazon.com. Look forward to seeing you next week. In the meantime, let's keep in mind the advice Paul gave to Timothy, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all, apt to teach patient. In meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves at peradventure, God will grant them repentance according to the acknowledging of the truth. Let's keep in mind that when it comes to the truth, where you stand is critical, but it is not just where you stand, it is also how you stand. Good being with you. God bless.